Hi, I'm Brennan Baker, BB Miniatures, and welcome back to the Pro Palette. In this part two of the Blood Angels Terminator Captain from the new Leviathan box set that I received as a promotional pre-release from Games Workshop, we will be covering the methods of painting both the black Aquila on his chest, which will also be the color recipe for the Crux Terminatus on his uh, shoulder pauldron, the uh, I guess the other Terminator armors on his left leg, and actually the other black areas such as the soft armor flex joints and the storm bolter casting, just with uh, a few less highlights overall, but the same colors. As well as in the second half of the video, I'll also be showing how the gold NNM is painted with the full sequence of the model's left shoulder pauldron. Again, this will give you the color recipe for all the various gold elements that are on the model. Just like from the red armor tutorial in part one, we will be utilizing the same light placement and have it directly influence how we highlight both the black and the gold areas. This is a vital this is vital in order to create this lighting and feeling of the model as a whole. Not having these aligned will make the model inconsistent and <laughs> kind of confusing for the viewer. Looking at the Aquila on his chest, we should note a few key features to help understand the shape. First off is looking at the base shape the body makes up. I'll refer to this as the parent shape. These features, which are placed on top of the parent shape, are such as this Aquila, for instance, that'll include the, um, the skull, the crown, the, and the feather wings, all these will refer to as the child elements. In general, we are looking to place highlights on surfaces such as apex of curves, edges facing towards the light, and elements which have open faces and closest to the light, much like how we looked at the red armor. What makes elements such as this Aquila being a child element is that it is mounted or wrapped on top of its parent. Looking at the parent shape, we can look at it's a cylindrical shape of the torso, as well as wider on the top half, and it starts to taper inward at the negative angle moving down. With the various shapes of the child element, noting the curves, edges, and facings, this must also match and be directly influenced by the parent shape. We can see light on a cylinder running lengthwise down the shape, as well with that, on, uh, that at the taper. Our light starts larger at the top, and then reduces its intensity as it goes down. This is the same thing as in the Aquila. The largest highlight is focused at this point, and starts to grade along down its side and downwards, with highlights getting smaller and catching only on a few key curves since these are protruding outwards the most. Also note on the left side of the chest where there's a dark shadow that runs down the middle of the left wing. This is a direct influence to the parent shape of the cylinder. Where the angle is facing away from the key light on the chest, we bring back a much smaller highlight at the end of the wing. This is due to it being right next to the light that's being aimed at the corner of the left shoulder pauldron. The light there, which, is, which isn't as large as our primary key light at the front, this still gives a light influence that reaches the left side of the Aquila and acts as a little form of a rebound. This balance of light gives a nice and clear hierarchy of the spotlight effect, illustrating the volume of the chest, as well provides a nice rim light when viewing the model from the front principal angle. Instead of the left side of the chest fading into a complete shadow, Adding that rebounding rim light fills the very edge with, an, with a small outline providing a more defined border and making the volume appear larger while still providing us with the contrast needed to illustrate the effect. The gold NNM will work in the same manner, but as you can see we'll be adding extra shines and a more pronounced highlights to help illustrate the difference in materials. Um, one being a more matte black surface and another being a more reflective metal. As a final note of the colors, again, green is being introduced in a buried way to help give more contrast and play with the red armor. More field green is in the base of the black Aquila, as well as Gobi Brown uh, from Scale 75, which is a brown with a more dominant mixture of green in there, is used as the foundation of the gold. Again, this is by no means the right way to paint, but rather a theme I've set on to giving this model a more distinct feel. You could easily use a more ochre brown or even a warmer red brown for the gold with more pure yellow, etc, etc. And you know, still follow all the highlight placements, brush strokes, and techniques to get a great looking NNM gold. So don't really stress if you don't have these colors, but it's something I want you to be aware of in my creative process. 
and the creative choices I make that will affect the total outcome of the piece. Now, just before we start applying paint, I would just like to ask that if you've been enjoying the tutorials and would love to get more, consider joining me in becoming a member of the Pro Palette. On there, you'll gain access to over 100 hours of tutorials in much the same deliverable fashion. You know, full multi-part tuto model tutorials ranging from the Horus Heresy, Warhammer 40k, Age of Sigmar, and other Games Workshop games, and focused technique tutorials under the Foundation series. Signing up today and using the discount code TURNINGPROBAT at checkout for 50% off the first month to give it a try. Members also gain access to my Discord where you can share your progress, you know, ask for feedback, and receive critiques and help from myself to further your painting growth. Or if you just want to stick with YouTube, which is completely fine, consider helping me out on this channel by subbing if you haven't already, liking the video, uh, leaving a comment, and of course, sharing it with others that you think that would benefit from this painting tutorial. Okay, so that's enough of my introduction. Um, let's crack out our brushes and our wet palettes and let's get started. All right, so first off, we're gonna start off with the black Aquila. On the palette here, we just have a few simple colors. We have black, field gray, and white. And again, this is all by um, scale 75, the uh, scales color, as well as for actually the majority of this entire model, I'm using an Artis Opus um, number two. Um, pretty fairly new brush, so it has a pretty good sharp point and uh, it holds a lot of paint really well. The mixture here I'm just doing is uh, just mixing a lot of uh, field gray with a bit of black, so you get a very, um, you know, very low value starting. And this is all over a, um, a, a black, uh, a black surface, you know, just pre-painting the entire thing black. And we're going to start off by putting on the highlights. The paint mixture that I'm doing here is actually, uh, it's about 30, let's say 30% water to, um, you know, 30, 40% water to like 60, 70% paint. Um, but when you, a note when you are painting with the number two is that since the, um, since it's a larger brush, you know, has a bigger belly, um, this also, also holds a little bit more moisture. So if you're used to painting with a smaller brush, or if you've watched uh, several of my other tutorials, you know, I'm pretty uh, used to, <laughs> I really like using the double zero. But when you're switching to a larger brush, or if you are, just be aware that, you know, the brush actually holds a little bit more moisture um, than uh, a smaller brush. So therefore, when you're doing your consistency in your palette, um, you might want to run just on that tiny bit of the thicker side, just because of when you rinse your brush and you wipe it off, um, you know, your brush never comes completely dry. There'll be some moisture in there. But besides that, all I'm doing is just mapping out the highlights. Now, if you notice from this video, I've actually done it in reverse where I released the first video with, um, with doing the red completely and then moving, uh, and then now I'm going to be, of course, showing you the black and the gold, but I actually did the black and the gold before I painted all of the highlights. So not all the highlight points are, you know, super defined. You can actually see the remnants of like after the airbrush and uh, the wash has been has been done with the, the contrast, but none of the brush highlights have been uh, applied. But what I'm trying to emphasize here, of course, is um, just like I was talking about the introduction on where those light placements are, that's uh, very key in terms of how we can get this uh, the sort of like lighting and, and spotlight effect. But again, carefully, just using the generally just the tip of my brush and just a little bit of the side, I'm just getting uh, using the nice point of the brush and just mapping out the, the first lights. And uh, just of course to increase value. I just get a little bit of white in there and you know we want to yeah making slow progressions at a time you know um, this is a, a pretty simple um, layering technique so we're just going from literally just a darker value up to a lighter value a good thing to note when you're watching and observing this is the effects of like wet paint versus dry paint <laughs> i think some of my students might be a little bit tired of me saying this but it it's very critical is that the paint that you put down at the initial most likely 
well, in most circumstances will be they'll look brighter it looks lighter when you apply on the model but as the the paint dries uh, it starts to get a lot more dull so a good rule of thumb is especially if this is you know if you're not so familiar with the transition or with the colors or you know if, if this is just a little bit more new to you and you're doing the tutorial is just do a single stroke don't don't do all the highlights but like actually um, sounds kind of boring but watch the paint dry um, just so you get an accurate value of what you're actually laying down because if you're always judging your highlights and everything else according to wet paint this is such a skewed perspective and you'll end up actually probably um, either uh, like over painting or you know just making um, <laughs> the wrong value adjustments because we're not um, we're not doing that we're not judging it on the the right state of the paint we should be judging it when it's dry so again you can see that gap that I've left and just doing a little bit of the rim light there on the left side now for the upper highlights now of course again like you know when we're painting a black surface a big thing and key to note is that even though it's black and but it still gets highlights you know it still gets a higher values but we also have to be we also have to watch like the size of the highlights so in these upper highlights look how small the areas that I'm actually covering don't be don't just go on autopilot and just coast through and just do every single highlight you know following along the edges um, if you notice on the right side of the wing the highlight that it gathers is actually down the middle between the two sets of wings. You know, there's two overlapping. Um, there's the inner part of the wings and the outer part. Uh, sorry, feathers, I should maybe say. But the highlight actually just on the right, on the right wing there, actually falls down at the tip of the inner feathers, and then on the inside, the inner side of the outer feathers. So you move that around a little bit because that should actually correlate and correspond with the uh, again the 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 placement of the of the parent of the cylinder and since this child element is wrapping around we should be following suit and highlighting at that accordingly Again, a little bit more highlight if you do need to switch to a smaller brush you know by means go for it if you feel that you have more control you know it's whatever brush gets the job done is going to be the right brush for you um, you know you don't have to if you find yourself a little bit um, you know not very accurate with like a number two switch down to a one or a zero or a double zero whatever can get you a good control on that point and there's the, the tiny bit of the highlight that I was talking about on the rim on the left side, leaving that gap. I only hit, I think, two or three of the feathers at the most. That's all it needs. <laughs> and look, we're already at the max lights. You know, it's not a very large area. And, you know, with a few uh, black areas, actually, this this part of the painting actually goes quite quickly. So by adding a more white into our mixture, remember this is still an off-white onto here. We don't want to go into full white right now. Um, that would be too high of a jump. And also this way, as we're keeping it small, keeping our paint thin, as we get to these higher highlights, a general note that I like to go, I like to make the paint a little bit thinner. So if you're rocking at around like, you know, 30 to 40%, this is where I'm getting into like, half a uh, half water uh, half paint um, mixture on the consistency on the palette this just allows me to make more fine-tuned adjustments because these last few lights are I think are like very critical again um, you know keeping your point nice and sharp and getting those highlights really really small as well as with a thinner paint mixture uh, the paint is a little more translucent so it really helps um, blend those areas together if you notice there's no like i'm not using like you know i'm not doing a ton of like not doing like feathering or glazing or not even like bridge blending if you've seen that tutorial this is just straight up layering and since the you know we're keeping the consistency nice and thin and the area of the highlights are fairly small we can just use these natural little points and you know 
they work to uh, they work to blend and highlight themselves quite nicely. And all I did there is I just took a little bit of pure white, no real dilution, just a very very tiny little dots at just a few of those points, those four points right there. Don't go carried away. If you give too many white dots, um, you know you overexpose the entire area, and you you'll actually start to lose that effect. All right, time for the gold. So the colors I'm going to be using here, first off, I'm laying down is Gobi Brown, and then Sahara Yellow, and finally Tenerere Yellow. We'll also be using a little bit of black and some white, of course, again, all by scale 75, scale color. I'm going to start with the foundation of mixing Gobi Brown and black. Again, like I said in the intro, uh, that Gobi Brown if you really stretch it out, it actually has a, a little more uh, leaning of green into it. A little bit hard to see, um, but especially when you um, you place it against reds and uh, keep adding white, you'll actually see it in the color. And you can also do that trick for any other browns and other colors, um, especially within like the brown kind of range of like mud. So you can. Um, you know, you can kind of see where the, uh, the kind of like the, the origin or whatever is hidden in the color in there anyway. So, uh, you know, after base coating the entire gold area in that Gobi Brown and Black mixture, um, now it's pretty much going to start laying down uh, a base of uh, Gobi Brown and start picking out the highlights. Again, in a very similar fashion, you know, we have to be aware of where our light points want to be. Now on this, uh, uh, on the shoulder pad here, on the back end, um, we're gonna be gathering the light pretty much like close to see where that decal, the, where the Blood Angels decal is on the left corner of the of the wing of the icon. That's pretty much where the um, where our focal point, where our light and the apex of the curvature of the light angle that will be. But another tall tale sign is when we start painting the NNM is that where the primary light hits is going to be the most uh, solid of the paintworks and the solid of the color. And as it goes to the edges and as we want to, um, you know, as it starts to um, dissipate or, you know, like start to fade into the, the darker transition, um, the brush strokes and the fill actually gets a little bit looser. And also what I mean by looser is it starts to um, it starts to have a little like break points in them um, so we can actually see uh, a little bit of a ragged edge and we can see the previous layer underneath which is that uh, that mixture of black and gobi brown be more apparent this kind of just gives you like a uh, a rough transition and instead of uh, just you know relying on such a, a smooth transition right away we don't have to do you know a, a ton of blending in that sense this just allows us to to lay down a pattern as well as with metallics it's kind of helpful to you don't have to make them extremely smooth all the time on contrary actually a lot of nnm and various reflections are not always smooth you also have to remember that with a reflective surface and a smooth surface it's reflecting the environment around it um, the highlights are actually, like the brightest points are actually the light source. And the other secondary like lights and like the shadows that are involved are also not only can be, um, you know, areas where the light doesn't hit, but also the dark areas can actually be objects that are within the scene. So anything from like uh, buildings or like tanks, movements, or, you know, just large pieces of scenery that have, you know, <laughs> various values associated with them. Most things that are, that are not super reflective will actually turn up as dark spots in metal anyway when it's being reflected. Um, you know, we don't have to go crazy and start painting a battlefield within the scene because, well, one, um, I'm not going to paint to that degree of detail, but also, two, is that this type of gold that, that I'm painting and illustrating here is not 
unlike it's nothing like a chrome nnm like not a chrome gold but it, it, you know it, it's gold with an armor so it has like it has some shine to it but it's not going to be like super like sky earth reflective kind of thing but definitely at the beginning of this stage you know you can afford to be a little bit loose you don't have to be super accurate at all and it helps to have like a little bit of a sketchiness to it because as we highlight and we go upwards we can start to favor um, certain highlights as you go up of course now i'm starting to get the next value in so it's you know with some goby brown i start mixing in the sahara yellow and of course the sahara yellow is going to give us more of our you know actual golden look to it um, as for the paint consistency, um, we can actually use a very similar paint consistency as we were using with the uh, the black and the Aquila. So starting off with around like 30 to 40% water to paint. Um, again, if you're going to use a smaller brush, like you want to use like a zero double zero or something like that, um, I recommend watering it down almost to 50-50 just because of the reduced amount of moisture that can be held in the brush because in this demonstration, I am using a number two in Artis Opus. So, you know, when we're rinsing the brush and stuff like that, there will be a little bit more moisture held in there and therefore whatever the paint mixture you have on your palette it just gets a little bit more watery um, using a number two. As you can see, like you can see the, you can start to see where I'm actually gathering the light and that light is also being gathered because one, the size of the highlight and two of like the 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 fill of the the opacity of it a really good thing to note is the inner the inner part of the of that trim we still want to uh, <laughs> we still want to create highlights not only on the outward edge but actually the the inner edge of that that 90 degree curve or that 90 degree like pretty much bend where it goes horizontal then goes into vertical the reason for that is even inwards edges, as long as that edge is facing up towards the light, that edge will kind of act like an outward edge highlight. It will gather light. It's because of the, of the, um, the surface on uh, the, the two angles are actually funneling and reflecting light back into itself and gathering itself in that edge. It won't be, most of the time, it's not as prominent as an outward edge, but still regarded, um, treated as an edge as such. You might also be wondering about the highlight placement of why I didn't make a big one at the very, very top. And that's just simply because of the light placements I chose to play, uh, start to put it. If this was just a zenithal highlighted model, you know, just light just coming from above, yeah, the, the, the apex <laughs> of that curve would be at the very, very top of the shoulder pad at that zenith. But um, since I opted to put a highlight point on the left uh, left and right, um, you know, just uh, got to respect um, my light placement on where I did, especially where I did at the beginning stages of the airbrush and the red. And then we have to make them all line up so they're all cohesive. There you go, just more value. So again, I'm building it up slowly. If you can see a similar pattern, I've actually been doing the, the very similar to what we're doing with the black in terms of just going up in stages and um, you know, just increasing the value and adding a little more Sahara yellow. Um, since we're dealing with more color rather than just a black uh, black Aquila, there will be some more. Um, there's some a few other variation steps that are not used in the black, so um, don't think that it's just going to be a straight up highlight from dark to light. There's going to be some other stuff coming pretty soon. But as you can see, I'm just increasing, I'm increasing the light. And as a good habit, um, I always like to start where the primary light is. This just kind of helps me, um, this kind of just helps me focus and reiterate where the primary light source is coming from. Um, and then I can also create the size that I want. And then all the, and then the rest of the, the rest of the highlighting, if I'm going to put secondary shines or whatever, um, I can adjust them accordingly to uh, the size of the primary, which should always be the largest.
in very much most cases. So you can even see there, like, uh, I just just leaving like little little gaps as we're going up higher and higher, and you can do those little variations, and with the consistency of the paint being a little bit transparent as we're painting, you get little uh, you just get um, you let a little bit of the transparency kind of work for you and create interesting or um, you know just. A uh, little more natural type of like um, highlights that are being built up on here with with various values. Let's see how I make this little secondary one right here. It's a lot smaller in size. It's not as large as our uh, as our big one in the back here. Again, like similar to the Aquila, you know, I always like to, you know, creating a, a a key light, as you could call it, the largest light, and then the secondary lights that you want to fill it with if you want to give more, more light to the subject, just make them smaller. You know, that way you have a bit of a hierarchy and you know where, you know, the focal point is. A good general, you know, rule of thumb is, um, work in halves so like the size of uh, this one on the back of the shoulder um, but and then when you move to that uh, thinner <laughs> thinner light in the middle um, you know it's around half the size if you also start noticing now the consistency of the paint as I move up in the highlights I'm getting into here I'll start to thin the paint out just a little bit more um, I like working this method just because I feel it's a little more precise and I'm making, since I'm making, I'm painting in smaller areas, um, I also want to have a little more control and, um, and you know, just bringing it up a, just a tad bit slower, just so, uh, you know, I get a little more accurate and I can uh, build up those lights accordingly. Because as the painting's going through, you know, it starts off uh, the first few stages are rougher, but as we get brighter and brighter, we're getting a little more refined. We're making a little uh, more um, defin uh, defined choices. And I find just with a bit of a thinner consistency, this also helps so that we don't get too much paint buildup, <laughs> uh, you know, or else uh, it might, if we just kept at a thicker consistency with all, with all these layers, you know, it might run a risk of getting a little bit too, um, you know, pick, uh, built up with physical amount of medium that's on the model, and then we'll start to see um, the paint, and, and you know, maybe it causes the surface to be a little bit bumpy or irregular, um, which um, I don't want. <laughs> And don't always be afraid, you don't have to go, you know, when some people are doing like NNM and stuff and making like these, these gradients, you know, don't, don't think of it at all, all these gradients have to be even. It's far from the fact, you know, you, you shouldn't just be looking for every single tra uh, transition to be um, smooth and even and you get to see every single stage. In fact, if you do that, um, it actually doesn't look shiny at all. It looks a lot. Um, it looks very matte when you do that. Um, so, you know, give yourself a little bit of play, a little bit of fun. Um, at the beginning, it does get, it, it, it will feel a little bit of a hard balancing act, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but a good thing to do is, um, you know, even with this video, it, is copy it. You know, go through the stages and copy like where I'm placing these lights and where I'm overlapping some lights even. Um, and just by your experience on doing that and just kind of trusting a little bit of the sketch and the chaotic nature of it will actually help you in feeling a lot more comfortable. And when you are doing NM uh, with like gold or whatever, you will get a lot more comfortable with like the first few stages um, being quite loose, feeling it out. And as you're building up these highlights, then you're you're making more refined choices 
uh, and in general like if you stick with the the general rule of like always starting at the key light like the main focal point it just makes it a lot easier because it gives uh it gives the process a little bit of order to it rather than just jumping around everywhere randomly you know you have a home base to start off make that transition or make the make that um make make that highlight placement well with the right value and then um you know be uh, uh then just kind of a uh, placing uh building up highlights as you as you feel maybe making little jumps and especially when you keep it a little bit loose like that you will actually create some like really quick transitions and then also some longer transitions which actually tend to feel a lot more natural when you're painting something reflective. You can even see demonstrations of that if you go in the home and you you know you look at your um, kitchen faucet which is most likely chrome or a very reflective surface or other reflective materials around the house. You know you actually notice if you look carefully you, you'll see various items and even notice like different degrees of transitions. So we're going to take a break from just using the Gobi and the Sahara Yellow and we're going to add some color variation to it. The first color I put down which I'm mixing in right now and creating a glaze is with uh, Kalahara Orange, I think that's how you pronounce it. And then the, the secondary color is actually a brown ink, both again by Scale 75. Uh, the brown ink is from their intensity ink intensity range. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to apply this glaze into um, not on the key highlights so like the two primary big highlights i have the one on the left which is the back left and then one on the front right i'm going to be adding this entire glaze into the midsection and into the uh and into the shadows too but i'm just trying i'm mostly avoiding the uh the highlight the the main body highlight as much as i can the reason for this is that with metallics, you have to remember that it's reflecting the environment. Now, with gold, a lot of the gold stays, um, you know, pretty pretty rich because it's a pretty dominant um, color stained within the reflective metal. But it's nice to add little hues and variations. You can actually get really creative with this and have a lot of fun. Like you could add reds, <laughs> you know, I don't know, you add purples, um, greens or maybe just a little bit of blue. You know, you can kind of have a lot of fun with it. But I kept it within this range because like one, um, the orange would be a lot, uh, another warm color to add into it. And then also the same thing with the brown. So that just kind of like um, gives you a little bit of a temperature variation where we were working with that Gobi brown, which is more on the cool side, because again, it adds some green. But here, you know, we're adding a little bit of this orange, which actually helps bring a little more richness into the gold. So it's not just, um, it's not just totally pale. Um, and again, I'm applying this brown, this brown ink. I actually, you know, I did mix it with some of the orange and it's just applying it on the straight spots here. The, the, the main key thing is that I'm trying to keep away from our primary key lights of, our, of those highlights that we built up as well as the with the consistency you know with the inks with that little bit you know adding like four to five parts water to one part paint just to dilute it i don't want to again you know go too hard or heavy the thing is with glazing and, and doing areas like this that you want to be as non-destructive as possible with and by just making it a little bit thinner you know uh, later on in the model, I get a little more confident. I know how much of the mixture is because after I paint this first part, you kind of learn about it. So um, besides that orange part, let's just keep adding more light. <laughs> so now I'm just introducing pretty much like Tenere yellow into the mix. This is where we're going to start to see the shine really, really bright. Uh, another key thing that I forgot to mention earlier about painting NM is getting comfortable with what it looks like to the stages getting up to this point because coming up to this point it looks kind of like bum <laughs> uh, or like ass for the better term you know it's not it's not looking awesome and it's because like um, 
you know, we haven't built uh, that real big shine yet, but this is where it's going to start to like really come alive and pop off a little bit more. What you also saw me do there is like when we start using pretty much like tenor yellow or if you like Vallejo and you're from that Vallejo line and using ice yellow, awesome color. Um, we can add that into the Sahara yellow, but this is not even pure tenor yellow yet But as we put it down, we're adding that tenor yellow into the Sahara yellow We can start to see a really good jump in our in our values that we're using here In all honesty, I probably could just jump to the tenor yellow, but I, I didn't you know I mixed it in with a little bit of the um, Sahara yellow, which is fine um but a couple of things, another thing to note is like, especially when I get on the edges of everything is a good habit to kind of make a little more of an interesting um, shines and edges is don't always just run your edge highlight just purely with a single line. Um, doing little, little dots and little skips in them, especially as they move away from the key light, the key light position, it, it actually gives you the impression of the, um, the light fading off a little bit because you do have like these little incremental spaces little dot spaces in between that are not completely filled as well as it also gives the again the impression of um reflective uh, uh, reflections in the environment you know um there are going to be um little objects and things that are within the environment that will break up the light and such like that so um, especially as you're moving away from there our main our main key light points there you know um, break up that edge highlight a little bit it, it's a small little detail but i find um it's like those little, little small things that i can add just like little extra touches to your metal and help it feel a little bit more alive And also on flat areas, if you noticed, um, <laughs> one of the one of a key popular shape is um, kind of like an hourglass shape. So not trying to create every single um, you know highlight shape as this like flat bar. A lot of times I'm trying to put like concave or convex um, little curve breaks, especially on the uh, see the the flat parts. Uh, that run along the top of the rim here. You can see, you can see little concave and convex um, breakups of the shape, rather than just being always just a pure straight line or an, a line on an angle. You know, you can kind of um, keeping a little bit irregular. I think just goes a long way to make it a little more uh, natural, and a little more interesting too. Here I'm just, um, you know, increasing a little bit of light on top of where I placed the a little bit of that orange glaze. Now, if I'd made the glaze stronger and that a little more orange, um, I wouldn't have to do that, or either that, or I would just have to um, increase the light and glaze over it. But what you're going to see me um, do in the the final chapter is. Uh, go back again just to add a little bit more orange but um and it will actually stain those highlights again and uh, bring the value up to where i want it to be so but right here you know we're really getting we're almost getting to like the max highlight territory here so this is like you know we mixed our like tenor yellow with some with some white and a little bit of sahara yellow so we're getting really really bright here and you can really tell with the, uh, especially on the camera, um, you know, keep it, uh, keep the highlight areas small. Uh, another, another rule of thumb is like when you're starting off these highlights and again, you know, starting at the key light position, it's always more beneficial to grow the light. Um, maybe I should have said that earlier, 
but um, regardless, when you're doing like highlights, it's always easier to start in the middle of a highlight and grow it and get to the size that you need. Don't paint the outline because if you paint the outline of the size of the highlight, you're stuck at that size. <laughs> you know, you only can go bigger. And if you needed to go smaller, well, you got to get the previous color and cut into it, create a bridge, you know, you get a little bit sloppy. So when you're doing, when you're doing, um, you know, straight layering going from, you know, dark to light in this fashion, um, going with this method, it's much easier to start in the middle and grow it to the size that you need it. It'll make your life a lot easier. And, um, you know, just by placing the highlight down, you can always take a look. Do I have the right placement? And then you can make uh, a good choice, um, you know, following up. Do I make it bigger? Do I make it bigger to the left, to the right, up, down? I think you get what I mean. But um, more importantly is the habit. Start in the middle, then, then grow it as needed. I apologize for especially this part you know it's, it's just slightly out of focus I apologize for the camera there um, I really thought in my monitor that it looked it looked sharper than it it should have been oh there we go now it's getting a bit nicer again So this is an optional part, of course, this is like kind of in the cleanup department, but you might need it. And this is where I go like to max shadows. And a general rule of thumb is I always like to do the max shadows before I do the max lights. So what I'm doing here is I made, I got a pretty much our base mixture of black and Gobi Brown together. And I am just cleaning up any mistakes, you know, really it's about like taking, you know, your time, you know, you've gotten all the work. Um, if you need to be a little bit more steadier, get a more detailed brush. I honestly thought I should have uh, taken a double zero, especially doing these, <laughs> doing a little bit around the rivets. Um, I don't know, I was like, I guess I was in a bit of a rush because um, this is a Games Workshop preview model and I got client work that needs to be done too. <laughs> so, but. Um, but yeah, yeah. If you don't feel comfortable doing a, a tuple, uh, doing it with a two, please get your detail brush and go at it. And like I said, you know, I do a little bit of cleanup with Mac shadows. Now I do Mac shines. The other reason is that if my brush ever slips, the Mac shadow and goes right on top of a, a hot, like a big highlight, well, the Mac shine covers it up, and you know, paint covers all and I'm working upwards. So this pretty much is almost like pure white. And if you look at it again, you can really, now you can really see the brightness of the, the paint job. You can really see where those, the two big main highlights are. They're in line with the key light that's gonna be uh, present on that shoulder pad. But again, if you notice, um, just being very selective and very spare, don't take this white and just go around the entire rim. You'll actually lose the shine and the brightness of the pad. All right, some adjustment time. This is again optional if you feel that your work needs it or not. Um, what I felt is I wanted a little bit more yellow in my work so what i did here is i'm taking a yellow ink again from scale 75 the um, intensity range and I'm adding a bunch of water to it so I, you know it's like four parts water to one part um uh ink and all i'm gonna do here is glaze over um, each area now the areas i'm glazing over are of the key lights so where I will use the brown and the orange to go into the secondaries and into the shadows. So the secondaries being that, that light that's running down the middle. 
and into the shadow areas, um, I'm using this in the opposite manner. So I really want to make our primary key lights, our, our lights a lot uh, more yellow. And we can just do that with some glazes. A big tip again to help you with glazing is that you really have to watch the charge in your brush. You shouldn't have a fully loaded brush and just like glob it on. You really want to give like skim coats to the thing. So if you load your brush and if you find that you're always blobbing on the paint on, what I want you to do is, um, you know, load your brush as normal and then wipe it on a kitchen towel, maybe like three to four times then uh, run your brush across the entire area. You'll notice you'll still have paint in your brush. You could actually rub off the paint on your kitchen towel like, you know, 10, 12 times or more. And if you dab the, the nail on your, on your thumb or you dab a white piece of paper, you're still gonna see some paint that comes out of here. Now, that's gonna be for extremely small changes where we are looking to glaze over uh, an entire uh, like a part of an area but it's to give you an idea like you know how little paint you actually need on your brush to get some control and uh, besides using a orange ink to bring back the orange that's pretty much it um, I'm just gonna leave you guys here with a few of uh, the photos Here's a picture of the side, and then this is with the, the finished area of the red. You can see how the left part of the shoulder pad lines up with the key light that's on the left part of the gold trim. And uh, another, another angled shot so you can actually see how the right shoulder pad with that key, with that key light lining up with the, uh, the gold trim as well. And as well as that also lines up again with the influence on the right pad. All right, thanks again for watching. Thanks again for joining me on this uh, Blood Angels Praetor. Oh, not Praetor, <laughs> Blood Angels Terminator Captain. Sorry, I played too much heresy. Um, but thanks again for uh, checking out and we'll see you in the next one. Happy painting.